So the Columbian Exchange, again, refers to this period from really the arrival of Columbus in 1492, probably till about 1750. And this map down here, of course, on the previous lecture on this subject, this map is much larger, but this map down here shows you all of the, the voyages of the explorers during this period of time. And what you really see here is the interconnection of the world. It's during the Columbian Exchange where you really see the creation of a world system, the incorporation of North, South, and Central America into the already interconnected world. And what the Columbian Exchange really looks at is examining how profoundly the world changed as a result of that interconnection, as a result of the incorporation of North, South, and Central America into the greater world system. So we're talking about an exchange process, an exchange process between the old world and the new world, the old world basically being all of this, Asia, Africa, the Mideast, uh, Europe particularly, are all part of the old world. They were already part of a very much interconnected economic world. Uh, there were spices from India and products from China that found their way into Western European markets. That, ha that was already the case before the sort of era of the great uh, uh, mariners of Western European history in the 1500s, 1600s and beyond. But it took a long, long time for those trade, those trade uh, processes to carry through. And of course, those trade items went through many, many hands on their way to a place like Spain or Portugal. And of course, we talked about in a previous lecture, we talked about some of the motivations and the initial motivation for explorers being particularly to locate a direct trade route to Asia. And of course, we talked about the Portuguese traversing ultimately the continent of Africa, locating and establishing the port uh, of Goa in India shortly after the, the, the circumnavigation of Africa by Vasco da Gama in 1498. Of course, Christopher Columbus in 1492 sails across the Atlantic in the employ of Ferdinand and Isabella of Spain, the monarchs associated with the unification of Spain. And, of course, the idea here was because Columbus, again, was working with a map that did not have a real representation of the size of the oceans as they related to the continents or the presence of North and South America. The goal was to establish direct trade routes. Eventually, you see the discovery of the Americas and the unleashing of a, of a profound exchange process between the old world, the interconnected world. Um, and the new world now being interconnected with that old world. So when you look at the Columbian Exchange, what we're talking about is we're talking about a transformation of environments. We're talking about the transformation of cultures and societies. And we're talking about the transformation of economics and really the development of, for the first time, a global economic system, a global world system, if you will. We're going to look at three aspects. These three aspects are disease, first of all, and then we're going to look at plants and animals, and then we're going to look at ideas and associated with ideas, also economics. So we're going to look at all three of these areas. Disease is one of the more profoundly significant uh, areas of, of this process uh, because a disease from the old world to the Americas were particularly devastating. Um, it's difficult for us to know, it's difficult for historians to know which diseases came from Europe to the, from the Americas to Europe. Some have surmised maybe syphilis, but it's very difficult to know because we don't have a catalog of the diseases that existed in the Americas that are then going to go to Europe. And so it's difficult to know, but some historians have surmised that maybe syphilis was a disease uh, the sexually transmitted disease that causes neurological problems and death, that maybe this disease went from the Americas to Europe, but it is somewhat speculative. Diseases that came from the old world to the Americas were diseases like smallpox, 
measles, bubonic plague, and chickenpox. And these diseases, particularly smallpox, ravaged, as did other, other diseases, ravaged Native Americans. Um, the death toll in some areas was absolutely shocking when it came to the degree to which smallpox um, decimated the populations of the Americas. They had never had any long-term exposure to this illness, and, and the result of this uh, was in many places a, a catastrophic loss of life. And so in many cases, smallpox causes the most significant uh, world depopulation, uh, arguably in the history of human civilization, if one considers, you know, the scale to which, you know, societies in some cases collapsed as a result of this. There were areas where whole tribes basically ceased to exist because of uh, the ravages of disease in uh, the Americas as a result of the arrival of Europeans. And these diseases, you know, traveled, of course, through the interconnections of tribes so diseases might have emerged in one part of the Americas and then through, because of course the American, Native American tribes, they might be far flung, but they were nonetheless, in many cases, from North America to Central America and to South America, they were also interconnected with their own long distance trade networks. And so diseases would have traveled as well through the Americas. And so many North American Native tribes, for example, were devastated as well, even though they weren't at the center of the sort of initial um, conquest from the Spaniards. And so disease will ravage the native populations. In fact, there are tribes that basically had such a death toll that they almost ceased to exist. And then they would unite with the survivors of other tribes, and in some cases form new tribes. So it had a tremendously devastating impact. This is an artistic depiction from the time of native people suffering with smallpox. And uh, this is an incredibly um, ugly and potentially deadly disease that the modern world, or, the, or I, should say, I should say the developed world, has uh, in the 21st century largely eradicated, though there are still cases of smallpox in the developing world. Disease is a part of conquest. Here you see a, a portrait of Hernan Cortez. And Hernan Cortez was responsible for the conquest of the Aztec Empire, which was located here in Central America, centered at the city of Tenochtitlan, which is located on Lake Texacoco, not, ne not far from the old city of Teotihuacan. Teotihuacan was not an Aztec city. We actually, historians actually don't know the exact dynasty that sort of founded that city. But they're located in the same area, which is in the highlands of, of central Mexico. This is where Mexico City is today. And the height of the sort of city and pyramid building of the Mayans in the Yucatan, um, and of course their predecessors, the Olmec, also in the areas around the Gulf Coast near the Yucatan, um, those Civilization's eras of height had, had largely passed. And when Cortez came, it's really, Central America is really dominated by the Aztec Empire. Now, the Aztec Empire, in many respects, uh, shared similarities with other empires that predated them from the Americas. They built, they built pyramids where there were ritual sacrifices. They were associated with the uh, worship of a warrior god, warrior gods, um, who required human blood to allow existence to continue effectively. Uh, the Aztecs believed that effectively maize, their food, primary food group, and blood were basically the two most fundamental components of life. And uh, as a result of that, the Aztecs um, carried out a great deal of ritual bloodletting and also of human sacrifice. Now, individuals like Cortez would have seen this as barbarism. In truth, it was a religious practice that was carried out with the uttermost, utmost seriousness. 
Um, in fact, there were priests themselves who, in some cases, in the Aztec world, submitted themselves to bloodletting. Um, it really speaks to the seriousness of how this this was what they had to do uh, effectively to keep the world sort of spinning, if you will, to keep the cosmos and human existence together. And so it was it was it was not per se barbarism, though it might be perceived that way. And likewise, some might look back on Western Europe during the Inquisition and or the Inquisitions imposed on people like the Maya and other groups in Central America and, and see that as barbarism. Uh, the assertion of, of a singular sort of uh, religious uh, dogma across Western Europe during the Middle Ages and, of course, uh, particularly in the later Middle Ages as well, uh, were, of course, enforced with, with incredible, well, ferocious power, torture, and death. And so uh, these are very important practices, and we really should look at these practices and assume that the Aztec civilization is necessarily a barbaric civilization, though the massive practice of human sacrifice uh, certainly made it look that way to Europeans who arrived there. Hernan Cortes and his conquistadors, they were privateers, by the way, and his contemporary would have been Francisco Pizarro. Pizarro conquered the Inca in the Andes Mountains in the city of Cusco in, in modern-day Peru, and of course Cortes his people are associated with conquering the Aztecs, centered here at Tenochtitlan. In many cases, this conquest was, was, was really made possible in part because of smallpox. Cortes Pizarro came with, with, with small numbers of people. And while they did have some advantages, they had weapons of Spanish steel, they had horses, they had, um, they had gunpowder weapons. While they do have those advantages, uh, the Aztecs far outnumbered them, even though many of their weapons would have been made of things like obsidian, uh, they nonetheless greatly outnumbered them. Though the Aztecs too did uh, sort of, uh, they did alienate many neighboring tribes. The Aztecs used to tax neighboring tribes, and one of the taxes would have been humans, which in some cases might have been enslaved, and in other cases might have been used for ritual sacrifice. So there were a lot of neighboring tribes in this empire. It is an Aztec empire, so in this area that is shaded here, you're talking about a central group controlling a number of different tribes, and oftentimes controlling them in ways that those tribes very much see as uh, repressive, and, and, and as a result of that, um, the Aztecs did not have a tremendous amount of friends in their empire, and they, they, those, those rival tribes certainly also helped Cortes. Interesting little story about Cortes. When Cortes arrived here on the coast, the Gulf Coast of Central America and Mexico, they had come from Cuba. Of course, Columbus originally arrived on the island of San Salvador and then explored areas like the coast of Cuba, and uh, they had come to Cuba, these, these privateers. Cortes and Pizarro are conquistadors. They are privateers. And they came from Cuba because the stories, again, this realm is being interconnected. People are talking. Ideas are shared. They're passed from word of mouth. And they're told that there are great cities in Central America and elsewhere of great wealth. And the conquistadors are really out looking for wealth. They're looking for plunder. They're looking for these types of things. And Cortes brought his ships and his few hundred conquistador followers to the Gulf Coast of the Aztec Empire here in what is modern day Mexico. And upon arriving on land, they received a welcoming party from the king, King Montezuma, who sent Cortes some fine, precious items. There's lots of gold and silver in these places, as well as. Uh, a girl, her name was Malinacci, and Malinacci became a guide for Cortez, uh, even though she was given to Cortez to be sort of like a concubine. But the conquistadors saw the wealth they were given as a, they were treated as though, though they were a diplomatic envoy. And the decision was made to make the trek up 
a mile up into the mountains where Mexico City is located today, where the capital Tenochtitlan is. And in the process of making this decision, a number of his followers wanted to leave because, of course, they heard the stories of this ferocious empire, this warrior empire that that, that blood let their gods, that committed human sacrifice and removed hearts for their gods and these types of things. And they understood that once you went a mile up into the mountains to Chenochtitlan, that returning would not be very easy necessarily. Pizarro was so possessed by a desire to plunder this wealth that he actually had the ships that were moored off the coast here scuttled so they couldn't be used. So that his followers had no choice but to continue on. To make a long story short, in Tenochtitlan, and Tenochtitlan was a city on an island. It, it was connected by causeways, four bridges that connected the city. And in the city, there were pyramids where sacrifice was committed. They were incredibly, there, he has a biographer with him, Cortez does, and they were incredibly impressed by the splendor and wealth of this city its building structures, its incredibly ornate uh, wealth. In the city, Cortes and his, and his followers would kidnap Montezuma and demand a ransom. The people in Tenochtitlan actually revolted. And effectively, they refused to pay the ransom. In their eyes, this meant that the gods were unhappy with Montezuma. And, you know, Cortez and his followers were run out of the city. They eventually created alliances with neighboring tribes on the outside of the lake. And eventually a war ensues. Causeways are cut. The city is sieged with like makeshift sort of boats that are built with those neighboring tribes on the land. And they will eventually uh, bring down the great Aztec or Mexica empire in 1521. But the number one reason for that is by the time the city had collapsed, when it was cut off, the disease of smallpox had ravaged the heart of the city, and it made it impossible for the Mexica to resist any further. In Inca Peru, Pizarro undertook a similar um, sort of approach to this plunder, capturing the king at Atahualpa, demanding the people pay a ransom. In the case of Pizarro, Atahualpa's people paid the ransom, massive amount of silver. Peru will be associated with a tremendous amount of, of silver. And as the story goes, Pizarro allegedly strangled Atahualpa to death with his own bare hands. And a civil war ensued. And eventually, of course, smallpox also ravages the people. The uh, conquistadors will conquer the Inca. They will burn and destroy many of their cultural artifacts, including the mummies in Inca Peru, the Peruvian people or the Inca people, I should say, um, had been practicing mummification for years and years and years as part of their cultural religious practice. But in both of these cases, you have plunder and disease on the part as a fundamental part of this conquest.